Welcome into the clubhouse here on this Thursday. It's almost Friday. It's just right around the corner. He's Jeff Rude. I'm John McGinnis. Well, Christian will be along in just a couple of minutes. I'm ready for the weekend. Yeah? I'm going to play a little golf this weekend. I'm fired up about you it. You haven't played since when? Like November. November. When I when I did my, uh, my my little deal in Pinehurst, Yeah. that's the last time I teed it up. And you're going to Florida this going time for it? Huh? I'm going to play a little golf. Dust them off? You were invited. I, I shipped the clubs. I sent them. They're already there. My clubs will be tan before I arrive. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a lot of golf going on as we speak. Yeah. Obviously, uh, they're, they're playing in Hawaii. Earlier today, uh, things got underway in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't think there's any surprise that Martin Keimer is playing great. I mean, yeah. How did we leave him off our top 20 to watch for this year? Well, we might have made a mistake. Huh? Maybe. Maybe. Well, and we admitted it. Yeah, at we, the time. we might have. Uh, we might have. Uh, Admitted it. All uh, right, he shoots great. 64. He shoots 64 at Abu Dhabi, John. He's, a, 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 you know, when this guy gets in uh, in a groove, he's hard to chase down. Yeah, well, it, not only that, he's and won here. three times. Won here. three times here, so he's going to be hard to chase down. Yeah, I agree. Although, wouldn't it be fun if the most interesting man in golf was able to track him down? He got a, he got the new year started in style. Oh yeah. Uh, watch yeah. this. He he, uh, he, yeah. he does. <laughs> the drinks are on the most interesting man. <laughs> Here you are. Here we go. Nice little three-quarter sawed-off shot there, too. I love it. Just driving them low and just sort of the hole and boop. Whoa, one hopper. One hopper. Johnny, there are go there's going to be red wine and cigars to go around <laughs> tonight. Are they allowed in Abu Dhabi? <laughs> I think they are. I think they are, too. Yeah. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, Martin Keimer leading the way. There's some interesting names. It's a jam-packed leaderboard. Thomas Peters. Uh, is a student of Mike Small. Mike Small flew to Abu Dhabi. Oh, yeah. To help him out Thomas Peters won the NCAA uh, as a freshman at Illinois, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Mike Small went over to give him a tune-up last week. I think it worked. <laughs> uh, so, as we said, a jam-packed leaderboard. The number one player in the world uh, shot five under par and is just three shots back, as is the Globetrotter now. Ricky Fowler. Ricky Fowler, yeah. yeah we got uh, we got Fowler and McElroy playing together. Both shot 67. There you go. Uh, Victor shot three under. Ernie Ells off to another good start at two under. And Justin uh, Rose. McElroy, right. you know, had a lull in his run. He birdied his first hole and then just kind of lollygagged for a while. And he birdied five of his last seven to catch up to Fowler, his playing competitor. Well, uh, should be a lot of fun. Uh, I'll be sure to catch. Big, one of the big surprises there, Henrik Stenson, number two player in the world. Uh, shoots 76, doesn't make a birdie. Yeah, How often you, does that happen? I wonder if he just set them aside for a month or so. I, I mean, some guys do that. They just they just set the clubs uh, over in yeah. the closet and let them sit. Uh, Henrik will be ready sometime yeah. soon. That's, I think he shipped them over there like <laughs> you did. <laughs> that that action is far too good for him yeah. not to uh, not to be playing well. Uh, another story that uh, came up yesterday, I believe. Yeah is this news about the 16th hole, a notice to competitors in the locker room at the Sony Open that they can no longer propel items into the gallery at 16 at the Waste Management. Propel. Propel. They can't throw. Can't, can't throw a football. Can't throw, kick, or toss. It didn't say you couldn't hand stuff up, so maybe guys could Hunt, stop. pass, kick. But out yeah. in golf. Phil throwing footballs, Patrick Harrington kicking footballs. Yeah? That's what do you think of that? I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Uh, I thought that it showed a, a side of the guy's personalities that you never got to see. Um, so for me, I, I always loved it. I, I enjoyed the whole. The people had such a great time. And of course, you know, there's Harrington kicking footballs in the gallery. You can still give stuff away. You just can't throw stuff. So maybe it's a safety thing. It but I tell you what, a few years ago when I went up in that grandstand to do a piece, sat there all afternoon to do a piece on the 16th hole, which is the most fun place on the PGA Tour. Agreed. Uh, it, second by a while, I think, is the 17th at Sawgrass, because everybody's watching for car wrecks. 17 at uh, Honda has become uh, a great yeah. spot as well. But anyway, I was going up the steps when a, P a longtime PGA Tour executive was going down. I said, what do you think of this scene? And he goes, we need to cut and paste and repeat. Yeah. He goes, we need this all over the golf tour, and, and now they're going to tame it down a little bit. Well, they're also doing a live at on, on PGATour.com from there this year, and maybe they just want it to be a skosh more dignified. 
More dignified than no dignity at all isn't all that dignified. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I know. Let's head over to somebody who's very dignified. Well, Christian. Why, thank you so much. <laughs> well, usually Paul Casey can be found in the field out in Abu Dhabi, but not this year. The Englishman who's won that event twice so far is part of the field for the Sony Open this year. Casey had decided to give up his European membership to concentrate on PGA Tour events. It's the first time since 2011 that he's had full PGA Tour status thanks to having made the FedEx Cup playoffs last fall. Two factors that played into the, de the decision, he and his wife live in Arizona and had their first child last September. The top-ranked players who decided to skip Hawaii for Abu Dhabi this week are certainly having a good time hanging out with each other. So much so that they decided to have a little contest prior to the first round. Rory McIlroy and Ricky Fowler teamed up against Justin Rose and Henrik Stenson in a pitch and paddle contest in which they hit balls of fish food at targets as their caddies paddled kayaks around. The team of McIlroy and Fowler won, although the shot of the day came from Stenson, who almost knocked knocked his caddy into the water. When asked who he wanted to paint his portrait, Jack Nicholas did not hesitate. He picked longtime friend Harold Riley. Nicholas and Riley have been friends for over 25 years, and the artist previously painted a portrait that hangs in the Golden Bear Golf Club in Florida. The painting was commissioned by the United States Golf Association Museum and is valued at £200,000. That's just over $300,000. Well, for more round-the-clock golf and golf lifestyle news, head to back9network.com. Check out the behind-the-scenes look at the making of Callaway Golf's Chrome Softball and for links to great content from the turn, off par, and, of course, all of us right here in the clubhouse. Well, coming up later in the clubhouse, more on the life of Jack Nicholas with USGA historian Mike Trussell. Plus, Guru of the Week continues with Jim McLean. But, but next, former PGA president of America, Jim Remy, stops by to talk some football. Oh, yeah. We're back here in the clubhouse with our regular Thursday guest, past president of the PGA of America, Jim Remy. Jim, how's it going? It's going great. I always look forward to being down here with you guys on Thursdays. It's a lot of fun to come down and spend some time with you and with Jeff and uh, talk a little golf. Well, there we go. Well, let's, we, we finally have some golf to talk about. We do, the yeah. The first event of the new calendar year took place this past week, and Patrick Reed became just the fifth player in the last 25 years to win four times before his 25th birthday. The only two Americans that have done that in that period of time are Tiger and Phil. Put Patrick Reed in perspective for it. Yeah, I think it's great. You know, it was quite an event. I watched every minute of it going down the wire, and I thought Jimmy Walker had that in the bag. It looked like he had it, and, you know, he just faltered a little bit coming in, and Reed was right there. How'd you like that putt he made on the last hole? I mean, there was a lot of confidence in that in that stroke. Uh, and that, boy, I'll tell you, that was some putt. He's looking like a top five player. Yeah. People made fun of that, but that might, by the time we get back to Doral, he could be one. Yeah, four, yeah. four times in the last 16 months he's won, and, uh, you know, that maybe he just is that top five player that he's talking about. He, he took the week off because he'll defend next week right. uh, at the Humana, so it, it makes sense, and, of course, he'll defend at Doral um, coming up. So he's playing great, and he's headed to some places that he loves to play. Keep an eye on Patrick Reed for sure. A lot of eyes are going to be across the pond this week as... There's a pretty good field going on over in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, not surprising when you look at Abu Dhabi. You know, it's a lucrative deal for those guys to show yeah. up at these events. It's kind of hard not to show up. Uh, you know, it looks like Martin Keimer's off to a great start. Rory, Ricky playing well over there. You know, boy, I'll tell you what, it's going to be an exciting weekend for golf, really, when you think about it coming up. It's just going to be great. We got. Two great things going, great events going on. Yeah, Abu Dhabi actually has more uh, players in the top 20 in the world than the Sony Open and uh, Hawaii does. Yeah, I, w I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't doubt it. And uh, you know, there's a real good reason for him to show up. 
And, and it's fun to say Abu Dhabi. It's fun to say it. I don't know why. It's just fun <laughs> yeah. to say Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Try it, really. That's I'm right. not kidding. It sounds like a t- cartoon character. It, 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 it's, it's, no, it's no laugh, though, right. when they pull that checkbook right. out on the oh, appearance man, fees. Wow. I mean, Tiger over $2 million when, it, when he's gone there. Yep. Uh, next week is the annual PGA Merchandise Show in Orlando. If, for the folks who haven't been there, it's, it's almost indescribable. You can't see everything. I don't no. care how long you stay from, from morning till night and for the two days, you can't see it all. Yeah, it's the second largest convention that goes on at the Orange County Convention Center every year. Over 40,000 golf industry insiders, you might say, show up in Orlando. It's the biggest event of the year. 14, 1,500 vendors will be on site. Just about every gadget you can imagine that has anything to do with golf is going to be there. You know, everybody's announcing their new products. It's exciting. What's the most interesting thing you've seen in all the shows you've been to? Oh, boy, that's a really tough question because uh, there's so much new innovation every year. They have that new innovation area every year, and there's so much uh, that comes down. You know, everything from, uh, you know, POS systems and computerized this and swing analysis and probably the teaching aids that are available at that show, the, the different things that you can do to uh, help improve your teaching performance. Do you have a favorite teaching aid? Uh, no, not really. You know, I'm kind of an old school guy. You know, I'm at that uh, gray hair age where you know, I'm kind of still living <laughs> in about 1979. So uh, I'm just more like, uh, what do they say? You got to take, dig it out of the dirt. Isn't that what yeah, it is? And, yeah. Practice is, uh, you know, the, the more you practice, the luckier you get. That, that is absolutely true. Speaking of old school, let's start with uh, w- with Bill Belichick and talk about those New England Patriots. That, I mean, well, you're, you're a Vermont guy, so, I mean. This is the weekend. Yes. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Massachusetts kid from when I grew up and huge Boston sports fan. You know, Red Sox, Celtics, Bruins, Patriots. Can't wait for this weekend. Couple reasons. One, obviously AFC Championship game, but they're also playing at Colts against my good friend, who's a big fan, Ted Bishop. So, you know, there's a lot at stake this weekend. Uh, the is Patriots there, look there, fantastic. Is there a little wager there? There generally is. We never pay each other, but there's a. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In that case, bet ten million. Yeah, we bet anything you want. <laughs> but, uh, it's going to be exciting. I think that you know Brady is you know arguably one of the greatest quarterbacks ever. Where does Jim Remy post up to watch the big game? I'm going to be in my house in Florida this weekend. Right. Actually, I'm heading down to the show, so I'm going to be at my house in Port St. Lucie, Florida, for the game on Sunday afternoon, and then tee it up Monday morning before I head up to Orlando for the show. Uh, well, I'm going to tee it up for the first time since early November this weekend uh, down in Florida as well. I'm pretty fired up about that, which means I need a Remy's Remedy because I don't even know if I can still get it airborne. You know, th- this week, just this, it's pretty simple. My friend Eddie Kirby, you may even oh, know, Eddie, I know Kirby. Eddie Kirby. My friend Eddie Kirby taught me this one. I caddied for him last year in the senior PGA, and he taught me a little trick. He says, every time you hit a putt, and this is something you can practice indoors all winter long on your carpet in your living room. Every time you hit a putt, hit the putt and count to three seconds before you move your head. Don't look up for three seconds. And I thought, ah, you know, that sounds, I don't know if I can do that. I can do that. Well, I started doing it. My putting got better. Right. So I think it's a great little tip. It's something you can do all winter long. You can do it in your living room rug or wherever and just hit that putt and count to three and get used to not looking up to see the ball go in the hole. And I'll tell you, you'll be a better no, that You know, that's good because a lot of people come out of it and miss, oh. it, miss it to the right of the hole. When you come out of it, they go to the right. Yeah. There's no question about it. Uh, it's a great remedy. I will try that this weekend. All right. Although, I'm hoping that the putting's still there. I'm not. I know the ball strike in the short game won't be there. I'm hoping there's still some some life left in the flat stick. You uh, you play well. We'll see you uh, in Orlando. That's uh, that's exciting. Stuff. That's going to be fun. And uh, spend about 20 minutes before you go out down there and chip and putt because people don't practice the short game you- enough. Is that with a Bloody Mary or without a Bloody Mary? Well, that's after a Bloody Mary. Okay. Okay. Oh. Just, just <laughs> Bloody just in the left sure. hand. This is, my the new, right. this is my new golf instructor right there. That, that Swing just, coach. Uh, that, that, just, uh, <laughs> that just solidified it. Uh, coming up in, in a few minutes, the USGA's historian is going to stop by to talk about the new Jack Nicholas documentary that uh, will be seen on Sunday before that football game, by the way. That's all coming up right here in the clubhouse. You've seen his work on the turn. Friday, you'll hear from Custon putter maker Sam Bethanardi. And we'll get you ready for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday as we celebrate diversity in golf with some special in-studio guests. All that and the very latest in Back Nine news. Join us on the turn at noon Eastern only on Back Nine Network. 
Back here in the clubhouse, we are joined by the USGA's historian and curator, Mike Trostel. Mike, thanks for stopping by. Nice, thanks for having me. Uh, a big week for, uh, for you guys and for the Nicholas family. Tell us about the documentary. Yeah, we're excited. So, uh, obviously, a big weekend of football coming up. Right. The, uh, of course, my Patriots playing against the Indianapolis Colts, <laughs> and then uh, Green Bay playing against Seattle on Fox. And, and what the USGA has done is put together a documentary, Nicholas, the Making of a Champion, uh, in partnership with Rolex, uh, that'll play right before that NFC Championship game, uh, really outlining Jack's life and career and uh, all of his major accomplishments, 18 major championships, of course. Uh, you know, so much more that he's done with golf course architecture. Uh, so we're really excited about it. What's the most interesting part of the documentary in your mind? I think it's the interviews with his, his family members. It's the, the unique perspective from Barbara and the kids. Uh, we talked to Jackie and Nan, his daughter. And there's a great story that Nan tells, not to give anything away, uh, but talking about the 1986 Masters and Nan's at school down in Georgia, in Athens. So it's only a, it's a short drive to Augusta. And Jack says, are you going to come? And Nan says, well, I was thinking about it, but I might go to SMU to hang out with some of my friends. And she chose to go to SMU, so she <laughs> missed it. And she's been kicking herself ever since. So, you know, unique little nuggets like that are pretty cool. It's, it sounds fantastic. Yesterday, there was a conference call with uh, select members of the media and, and Mr. Nicholas, and he talked about a lot of different subjects. Let's hear what, uh, what Jack had to say about the state of golf in the United States. I think American golf is... Uh from a tournament standpoint, is, is, is pretty healthy. I don't think we're as healthy on the, from, the, uh, from the juniors coming into the game, women staying in the game, uh, as we could be. And I think we're working on programs to try to, try to help that. Uh, but as far as tournament golf, uh, uh, you know, we're good. I mean, there's a lot of criticism came from the Ryder Cup and not winning about it. I think that's, I think you're going to go in cycles on that. And right now, there's a lot of really good players in Europe. and. Uh, they just played better than the American players. That's all there was to it. There isn't any magic about it. Uh, it's just that they played better. And so, you know, but that'll turn around. The American players will, uh, you know, they, they, they have their pride. They'll, they'll, they'll play better when, uh, as time goes on, and uh, uh, they'll, they'll win their share of Ryder Cup matches. So often when Mr. Nicholas speaks, there's a call to action. Uh, and in this case, there has been a call to action for the last few years uh, about trying to integrate more juniors and, and folks into the game. The PGA of America is on top of it. The USGA is on top of it as well. What, what, uh, what are some of the things that you guys have uh, going on now and some of the things you plan on pushing in the future? Well, I, I think Jack makes a good point. You know, with, with the Ryder Cup, certainly things do go cyclically right. as far as that goes. And with Ricky Fowler, we saw him with four top five finishes in the majors last year. So, yeah, I don't think we're too worried about that. But what the USGA is really trying to do is make sure that there's more accessibility to the game, whether that's for minorities, women, juniors, people with disabilities, anything to get people involved with the game and make sure that the game continues to be healthy. Do you sense that, you know, a lot of clubs have junior restrictions, can't play until after two on Sunday afternoon. Do you, do you sense that that's changing in America? Yeah, I think a little bit. And I think there's still a lot more that can be done about that. Um, but I do get that sense from traveling around the last couple of years that, you know, that curtain is being lifted up a little bit. Because you see some of these, these great players, you know, Jordan Spieth and Ricky, who are doing so many things before they're 21, Rory, that kind of stuff. So I think you definitely have seen an improvement and will continue to see that in the next decade. I, I agree with that. Uh, a lot of topics were covered yesterday in the call. Here's uh, what Mr. Nicholas had to say about the man chasing him, Tiger Woods. I think that uh, Tiger's had a great career, and I, th and I don't think his career's over. Uh, he's had a little lull in his career, and we'll, we'll see what happens from here. Uh, I, had, I had lulls in my career, too. I had several periods where I had three and four years, and I, I didn't win anything of a major championship. And, uh, uh, and I came back from that, and I, I think Tiger may do the same. But, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I did most of my career was I paced myself, I didn't play too many tournaments, and I tried to always be as fresh at the end of the year as I was at the beginning of the year. That was not easy to do. <clears throat> I received a lot of criticism from skipping a lot of events and so forth, but I had, to, I had to do what was right for me and what I thought was best to be able to be able to perform at a high level every time I played. Well, what I love about this is the younger generation is gonna finally see just how good Jack was 
Put Tiger in the historical perspective compared to Jack uh, as the USGA sees it. Yeah, I mean, make, make no mistake about it. What Tiger did, especially as an amateur, was incredible. The run that he had right. winning three consecutive U.S. juniors and then three consecutive U.S. AMs uh, and obviously 14 professional majors is amazing. But I think looking back, uh, looking at Tiger's career and then you can compare it to Jack's, just amazing how healthy Jack was able to stay, his longevity. Right. Starting from the late 1950s, early 1960s, all the way up through the late 80s, it was able to stay healthy and stay competitive, obviously winning a major at age 46. So I think, like Jack said, we haven't seen the last of Tiger. Well, he, Jack's lulls didn't have all these surgeries that right. Tiger's lulls have had. So that's one big difference there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think by Jack staying healthy, it was incredible. I mean, just looking at his record throughout the 1970s, he played in all 40 majors, 36 top 10 finishes. It's remarkable. <laughs> but Tiger looks like he's getting healthy, and uh, it'll be really exciting to see what he's able to do this year and for the upcoming years. It should be. Um, it should be a lot of fun. However, he's 39 years old. Nobody's won four majors after the age of after their 39th birthday. Several players have won three. He's four behind. Uh, he's four behind Jack. I hate to put you on the spot, but your opinion is just as good as anybody else's. Does he get there? Well, you know, I think if, uh, you know, if someone's going to win four majors after 39, it's probably going to be Tiger. Um, <laughs> you know, it seems like he's, he's really made an effort to come back uh, in, with his health in mind and maybe play a couple of fewer tournaments, maybe change his schedule a little bit uh, to accommodate that. Uh, if I had to say, will he do it? No, I don't think he will. I don't think he's done winning majors, but I think that mark of 18 uh, might stay for a little bit longer. Uh, it's, a, it's a great answer, and, and Tiger fans will forgive you for it. Uh, <laughs> Jack also talked about the individual versus the, the team sports, and uh, here's what he had to say about that. I think other sports have that, too. Uh, golf is, golf being an individual sport, you can pretty well tag uh, the efforts of an individual and his own results on on his record, whereas uh, you know Michael Jordan was part of a team, uh, Magic Johnson was part of a team, uh, uh, Brett Favre was part of a team. Uh, it wasn't totally their effort. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, the effort was part of other people involved with it, and in golf. Uh, in golf, it's really your your effort and your and your result of what you did. Sure, you're in competition with the other guy, but you're the only person you can control on a golf course is yourself. You, I have no control over what Arnold did or Gary did or Tom or anybody else. I only had control over what I did. I think that might be an oversimplification. I mean, we've all heard uh, Jack knew he was going to beat you, you knew he was going to beat you, and he knew you knew he was going to beat you. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. And I mean, it, it, what made golf so great in the 1960s and 70s were the rivalries. You know, it was the big three. It was Arnold and Gary going up against Jack Nicholas. It was great made-for-television stuff. And one of the other things I think makes golf great for television and great for writing is the fact that, you know, in a four- or five-hour round, you're only hitting shots for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So you get to hear a lot about the personalities, a lot about the people. And that's why we get to, you feel like you get to know these people, the Bubba Watsons and the Ricky Fowlers out there. Well, Jack, yeah, Jack had a caddy. But, I mean, he was about as strong mentally. I mean, you know, I've always thought that, you know, he's talking about you know, relying on other players. I mean, he was so good there, you know, letting other people, uh, you know, uh, beat themselves. And, right. you know, he won right. a lot of times that way. Yeah, he did. And, um, you know, his course management was some of the best. He was one of the first to use a yardage book. Yeah. Always so prepared, walking a course. It always go to a major a week early. You know, not Augusta, but the other ones where you, you haven't played the course as much to really familiarize yourself with the course. His course management, as you said, Jeff, was second to none. He kept his own stats because back then the tour didn't keep them for you. Uh, here's what he had to say about statistics in sports. Screens and regulation is about the only thing he ever kept. I always hit, uh, uh, I knew that uh, to win the Masters you had to be around, it hit at least 75% of the greens. And, and most of the other golf tournaments, I sort of looked at it the same way. As it relates to putting, I never really paid attention to that because that was really a product of how many greens you hit. Uh, they didn't keep all the other stats. I mean, I think, I think one year uh, after I was finished playing by, I don't know, 10 years, they, had, they finally kept driving statistics. And I think I was a long driver at 285, and DeWitt Weaver was second at 284. And uh, first, first time I ever had my... My swing speed checked, I was 58, and uh, 
I was out at, uh, I think it was either Titleist or Callaway, I can't remember which it was, out in the West Coast. And it's the first time I ever had my swing, swing, swing speed tested. And I was 118 mile an hour. And I said, wow, that's pretty good, I guess. And uh, I said, yeah, he says, there's only other one guy in the senior tour that said that Jim Dent was 118. And that's the only comparison I ever had. No other, you know, not, not, we never had any of that stuff. 118 miles an hour at 58 years old? Yeah, it's pretty impressive, and if yeah, pretty mem good. memory serves correct, that was yeah, the year he... wooden wooden club, maybe. Right, so. yeah, in 58, I think that was the year he finished sixth in the Masters, made a, a late run to right. get in there. Right, right. Uh, it's remarkable, you know, from the equipment that Jack was using to, uh, to any of that, the fact that he was, uh, you know, still swinging 118, imagine what he was in his prime. You know, here's the thing, you want to look at Nicholas's stats. Anybody who wants to find out how good he is, go to PGATour.com, Look at his stats from 1980 to 1985. First six years of PGA Tour kept stats. From when Jack was 22 to when Jack was 40, no stats. In his prime, those 28 years, or uh, what would that be? Yeah, 28 years. Uh, he led the tour in ball striking like three or four times and the, uh, at age 40, 41, 42, all the way to 45. How good is that? So that makes me wonder, how good was he back from 22 to age 40? I Look, mean, he said 75% of the greens. 75% of the greens is, is, is 14 point something a day, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, that's an awful lot of greens to hit. Uh, simply the greatest of all time. Yeah, I, you know, I think the, the only statistic you need to know with Jack is, is the number of wins. He was such a feel player all along. You know, he, he, could, he could tell. You know, if something was a little bit off, he could tell. It'd go back to his teacher, Jack Grout, uh, once a year at the yeah. beginning, and he said you know, the biggest lesson that Jack helped him with was to teach him how to understand his own game and self-correct when he's out actually right. on the course. Own his swing. Own his swing. You know, it, hitting fairways and greens. You know, he knew if he was swinging right, he'd do it. Set your DVR Sunday afternoon before uh, the Fox football game on Fox, the USGA documentary, uh, Nicholas, the making of a champion. I mean, it's as good as it gets, isn't it? Should be a lot of fun. It should be a lot of fun. You're going to probably want to watch it more than once. You're going to want to stick around here, though, because coming up, we continue Guru Week with Jim McClain. We'll be right back. Guru Week continues, and it just keeps getting better and better. Joining us right now is a gentleman who sits atop the empire that he built uh, right there at Trump Doral. Jim McClain joining us right now. Jim, how are you? I'm great, John. Nice to be with you. It is fantastic to be with you. Let's start right there with that property that we all got a look at last March after Trump bought it, uh, completely renovated the blue course. Give us an update. What's going on down there now? Well, John, there's been a lot since uh, you saw it on TV. It's grown in a little bit better. Uh, the hotel's been completely done, all, all 700 rooms. Still have the spa to be renovated. But uh, they've also completed the other three golf courses here that are really terrific golf courses. Uh, Gil Hans uh, and Jim Wagner did the gold course and the red course, completely renovated those courses, which are adjacent to the Blue Monster which is our centerpiece. And then um, I did the silver course in 2009, but we, uh, you know, they had problems here at Doral with uh, the company that owned it. And then um, Donald Trump bought it. And now they put in all brand new car paths. They've landscaped it, uh, redone the bunkers. Um, it It's awesome too. So we've got Johnny, I think four golf courses here that are pretty much unmatched in the East. Is that, kind of feels like Bandon Dunes of the, of the East Coast because you've got four really good courses right together and then a brand new hotel. Jim, your golf school, of course, is at Doral. Um, right. We wanted to talk a little bit about teaching philosophy. Can you run us through yours? Sure. Yeah, well, um, I, I have a system for teaching the game that uh, has uh, corridors and uh, parameters within it, and it's, the eight steps uh, is the basics of the golf swing, but really the centerpiece of our golf school is the 25% theory, which is our teachers being able to teach the long game, the short game, the management game, and the mental game. Uh, we're not uh, sports psychologists, but a lot of us have worked with a lot of the top guys, and, and to be a good teacher, you have to be pretty good on that mental side. And We get people out on the golf courses to play. We've got great short game facilities. And then another piece of what we do is uh, teaching uh, – 
at different levels are, are beginners and infrequent players uh, at level one. Uh, the the average golfer, the uh, weekend player, um, anybody above sort of a ten handicap and up is kind of our mid level player, and then and then we go to our single digit golfers and tour players, and we teach a little different at all three of those levels. I've I've kind of worked on all of our instructors. I've got 25 teachers here in the winter and 10 assistants. So I really don't think there's a busier school in anywhere that I know of um, for just smoking lessons. And um, there's really no place like uh, Trump National Doral either that's right near an international airport and makes it, you know, a really busy, busy place to be at. And it's, an, it's a luxury for me to be here. In addition to the golf school there, you have many, many golf schools, but you, you have mm -hmm. a, a boarding school for, uh, for young aspiring golfers yeah. as well. Talk, talk about that and how that came about. Well, that's a great thing in my life, John, where I was able to buy a course in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, we've got a big facility there, a 14,000 square foot uh, teaching center. Uh, upstairs, downstairs, we got a little restaurant in there, fitness, and then we have a small junior academy where kids stay year-round. We've got housing for them there, and uh, golly, we've had some great, just some unbelievable kids come out of there. Brad Dalkey has been the highest ranked as uh, number two in the United States. We had th three girls in the top ten last year. Uh, Kristen Gilman won the United States Amateur. She's 16. So we've got a facility there. Tom Fazio uh, it really helped me build that place, the range, and the, we've got a, a practice golf course out there where the kids can hit in any direction, and also our members, and it's right off I-30, right down from uh, Cowboy Stadium. Jim, you've worked with uh, various touring pros over the years. Uh, mm -hmm. I, want, I want to start with Keegan Bradley, who right. came to you very raw. Talk about what you saw when he came in and what you fixed. Well, um, John Curran, who just got on the tour, was his roommate. And I've worked with John since he was a, uh, a junior. So proud of John Curran getting out on the PGA Tour now. But uh, Keegan and, and was living with him up in Orlando, and he, uh, Ke Keegan wanted to come down, and he was playing on the Hooters Tour and not doing too good. And he walked in. He said, I really need to change some things and change my swing. So I asked him, had he played in the U.S. Junior or U.S. Amateur? No. Hey, played in the big amateur terms of Northeast Amateur, the Porter Cup? No. Was he ever an All-American at college? No. Was he an honorable mention? No. So, the, you know, I had a guy in there that uh, I didn't know who he was, except he was a friend of John's. And we started, uh, I made some pretty big changes in his swing when he first came. And three weeks later, he called me and he won a Hooters event, $30,000, which uh, got him to the tour school. That's the biggest check he's ever made, will, will ever make that one because he had no money. He drove down in a little car with the windows taped, I mean, the uh, mirrors taped to the side of the, that Ford Focus. <laughs> but uh, he's doing a little better now. And we had some great years. He's still a great friend. I worked with him for five years. He, You know, I was with him when he won in Atlanta. I went to the Ryder Cup and President's Cup with him. And uh, he played great here at uh, in the World Golf Championship, the Cadillac World Golf Championship we had here. He could have, could have won it one year for sure. But uh, Keegan's a great guy, and uh, boy, did we have a, a great run, John. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, did you know when you started working with him that his father was a member of the PGA of America and, you know, that had some influence over his uh, his golf swing? Oh, sure. You know, I obviously I talked to him. I, his, his dad was a, a pro up in Vermont. He's just also a ski professional. And, and then uh, I knew Pat Bradley, but he didn't mention that to me the first time. <laughs> I knew Pat real well because she was over uh, in in uh, Naples when I worked with Preventuri over there, and I, I, I played with Pat, and that's where she, where she practiced and played uh, when she was playing the ladies' tour. So obviously he's got great genes. I mean, it, he, I've had been very lucky to have a number of players that come to me when they were very young who are very talented and very gifted. And you know, John, when you get somebody like that, uh, you're way ahead of the ball game. And, um the one thing with Keegan, though, was he had some weird things in there, and he he obviously was talented. And I used the fact that he was a, a, a real top skier to talk to him about how he balanced his body and how he how he loaded into his right side. It moved a lot, of, took a lot of that head movement, and a, a real flat shoulder turn that he had out, and you know he responded pretty quick. 
Uh, there is no question. Uh, Jim, we need to take uh, a little break right here. Can you stick around and we'll talk some Hall of Famers and, and some and okay. some tips when we come back. Okay. That's Great. fantastic. More with Jim McClain right after this. Back here in the clubhouse, we are joined by Jim McClain from down at Doral. Uh, real treat, Jeff. Yes, it is. Hey, Jim, I know you have looked at Ben Hogan's swing left, right, up, and down. Even though he passed away uh, 17 years ago, 18 years ago, his influences still live on. Can you, can you talk about what influences live on now that can help the golfer at home watching? Well, I think Ben Hogan will probably cast a big shadow over the game of golf and teaching maybe forever for his uh, accomplishments and for the writing he did, which was so far ahead of his time, talking about the big muscles and uh, how uh, the engine of the swing was in the core, the center of the body, and the, the really clear concepts of uh, swing playing that he, that he used in his own game. And then the results that he got, because uh, all the guys, that uh, all the older guys, of course, uh, or anybody that saw him play, some of the, even the older tour players, uh, they put Hogan at, at a different level. That and and kind of a, that mystique of Hogan is going to live on, I think. But I do know this: all the young teachers um, use still use um, Ben Hogan's writings and the things he talked about in, in their teaching. So I'm very much up on and try to be up on what what's going on in the, in the modern teaching world and. We have everything in the world down here at Doral, all the sophisticated uh, 3D uh, biomechanics and, and body track and, and uh, track man and all, everything, you know. So that's all great, but what, what Hogan brought to the table and uh, being able to really study his ideas and uh, how he did the preparatory moves before he swung, the waggle, the setup, uh, how he tried to groove the backswing, and, and then obviously his sequence of motion, which is called kinematic sequencing in modern golf, but he just called it, John, something you and I can understand is the hips started first, then the shoulders, <laughs> then the arms, then the hands, which is always when I teach people, they get that, you know? No question about it. If there's folks listening who may be coming down there next month uh, to uh, enjoy the sunshine and, and learn something at the golf school, what would you tell them to do for the month leading up to, uh, to coming down? Well, John, um, we do a tremendous amount of individual instruction. We do a lot of three-hour pro sessions, but we do one-hour lessons, tons of them. But what I really love to do is the golf schools where I, I've got somebody there, say, for the three-day school, and I've got three days to work with them, and I get to know them. But It's in a little bit of a group setting, which uh, we learn all sports. But they get away from home. They put the phone away. They really immerse themselves in the game where I can work on on all types of bunker shots, flop shots, chipping, lag putting, short putting, get them on the course and watch how they perform on the golf course. And that's where I, to me, I've had my most success with the average, average normal golfer. Uh, when the tour players come down, I call them pro sessions because anytime I've had tour players down, I've been working with uh, Marina Alex on the LPGA lately and, and somebody that I've just started with, but I need at least three hours, and any pro that's going to come all the way down here probably wants more than that. But then I learned that, um, you know, a lot of amateurs like uh, a little longer time, too, and to really uh, get something accomplished when, when they're here in, in Miami. Uh, well, that's Jim, I'm dying to get down there. Uh, can we tee it up together? I'm going to need two aside. Absolutely. No, <laughs> no, Johnny. No, no touch. <laughs> I'm not that dumb. Uh, you spent a lot of years on the tour, and uh, you know I know you've had a lot of success out there, and uh, you don't you don't mess around with that. I I would love to play with you, though. I still love to play, and uh, it, I think it's very important for a teacher to get out there and, and uh, hit in himself. I, I couldn't agree more, Jim. We can't thank you enough for the time. Thanks, thank Jim. you, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank okay. you. That, that was that was terrific. I mean. Very successful in every aspect oh, yeah. of it. Love talking with Love him. talking with Jim McClain. We'll be right back with a slice of life and maybe a mulligan or two. Well, we want to make sure that you can join in on all the fun in the clubhouse too. So wherever you are, 
And wherever you and your friends are playing, make sure you send us your pictures from Instagram and Facebook. And of course, we want to hear what you're doing too, so tweet us your thoughts on the world of golf to at the Clubhouse B9N. Plus, you can always get the latest in golf and golf lifestyle at back9network.com. If you've missed any of our Clubhouse segments, you can find links to them right there too. Slices of life this evening in the clubhouse. You guys ready? Absolutely. A few little, few little yeah. stories. Right, the first one is an entertaining little video that you guys are going to like. Mitchell Skiba, um, a young defenseman for the Alpina Flyers, that's a Midwest Junior Hockey uh, League, had an embarrassing moment. Um, he got a penalty, had to leave the ice for misconduct. He was messing around and clotheslined himself on Whoa. the way out. I like the Look fact he just left the stick and took off. He <laughs> went running, didn't he? Like, he, you know, tail between his legs. But, you know, I was thinking karma bites. Okay, well, <laughs> I was playing uh, <laughs> in Vegas one year, and at the Las Vegas Country Club, they had those bridges that were, uh, you go up and then you go back down yeah. over a creek, and yeah. I'm in spikes, actual spikes. Uh -oh. And on the way down, my foot slipped. I had my putter resting on my forearm, <laughs> hands go up, club goes tumbling out of my hands right into the uh, the creek below us. No. You fish it out? I sent my caddy in afterward, after it. And just put your head yeah. down and we're like... Uh, well, it wouldn't have probably been so bad <laughs> if we hadn't been married at the time. <laughs> yeah, I sent her in after it. Your wife went diving in for your putter. Went and got it, yes. And you're no longer married? Yeah, I That's a good wife. That's a good <laughs> She that's a good caddy. Yeah. I'm in a frustration there. I mean, that's the game of golf. And right. you got to be careful in golf when you're uh, frustrated. Yes. Pounding the driver, the shaft might break and pop up at you, you know. Uh, who, you Remember know, Woody throwing Austin? A club, throwing a club or Remember whatever. Woody Austin beating oh, yeah, the putter? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I wonder if anyone's ever walked in the clubhouse, though, and clotheslined themselves with a club. Probably. You never know. If you know of it, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> right, this second story is um, quite ridiculous. Obviously, new websites pop up all the time, um, but one that's come out offers a service that I can guarantee you have never heard before. Um, it's address is shipyourenemiesglitter.com. <laughs> and basically, it's a service that for um, a bargain price of $9.99, you can have them send an envelope full of glitter, like that super tiny little annoying glitter that gets everywhere. And of course, when you open it, it goes all over the place, and in there is a note telling you, you know, like why you're disliked enough to get this big envelope of glitters. <laughs> is that really gonna happen? Well, I've seen the $10? website. I promise you, I've seen the is website. It? It's real, and okay. it's very funny. Why would you need the website to mail somebody glitter? I mean, if you were actually well, maybe gonna anonymous. Take effort. It could be anonymous then, couldn't it? Yeah. See where I'm going? Sneaky. You talk about karma, that is some bad karma there. But yeah. my son used to always say, if you really don't like somebody, Get them a pony as a gift. A pony? Yeah, because a pony, all the upkeep and the food and the, <laughs> where do you put the pony? I don't think you can when... ship someone a pony for 10 bucks, though. This no, but, uh, no, but, you know, cleaning service will take care of that glitter in no time. <laughs> to, to, to try to take money care to, of a pony, that's a lot of dough. Money back. I, I, I have too. given so many presents to my friends, yeah. children's, Glitter? that make really loud noises. <laughs> I mean, I'll, gi I'll give a two-year-old a drum set in a second. <laughs> <laughs> and then just sit back and laugh. <laughs> a drum set, yeah. <laughs> we got time for mulligans this evening. I got a quick one. Harold Riley, 80 years old. He's, yep. We talked about him. He's yep. going to do Jack Nicholas's portrait. He's already done the portraits of Nicholas, uh, Woods, and, and Ben Hogan. And when he did Hogan's, he went to Fort Worth. And after he felt comfortable after a couple of days, he said, Mr. Hogan, can I ask you a lesson about the golf swing? And, and Ben Hogan, uh, and Harold confirmed this to me, said, you're not here to ask me swing questions. You're here to paint my portrait. A couple of days go by, and Ben Hogan says, you know, not many people know this. I do some artwork myself. Would you like to see my artwork? And Harold Riley, bless his heart, <laughs> bless his we heart. We can see where this is going. says, I'm not here to look at your artwork. I'm here to paint your portrait. <laughs> you did the last interview with, uh, with Ben Hogan. Did you ever see any of the artwork? I did not see any of that. No, I'd be, I'd be fascinated to see that. Yeah. Oh, boy, we've had a, we've had a great show this yeah, evening. It's been, been yep. uh, an awful lot it's of fun. Always. Thank you for being a part of it. Tomorrow, when you wake up, it'll be Friday. And we're looking forward to spending a little bit of your Friday evening <laughs> with you. So come back tomorrow night right here in the clubhouse. We'll talk to you then.